Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'm Camille Whitehouse. I'm a visiting uh, scholar here at Microsoft Research, uh, coming from the University of Virginia, where I'm an associate professor. And I'll talk to you today about some of the work my group is doing um, sensing doorways and trying to use that information to figure out what's happening inside a multi-person home. <clears throat> um, so the first question is, why are we sensing homes? Well, for better or for worse, um, the average person in the United States spends 90% of their time inside. <clears throat> and 60% of that time is actually inside their own home. Um, that number can actually go up for certain populations of interest the elderly, um, children, people who work from home. And we're trying to leverage that fact to use the house, the home, as a window into the people's lives to understand what's happening in their lives. <clears throat> and for example, we want to know how much energy people are using, um, what they're using that energy to do, and how they might change their behaviors to reduce their energy consumption. We also want to understand um, people's sleeping habits, eating habits, and any changes in those habits or other habits that might indicate health or illness. And of course, we also want to understand social interaction in the house. Um, for example, how well and how effectively people coordinate to have dinner together or to share resources like a car. And the way people might do that today is to instrument the home, instrument the objects in the home, and instrument the people to understand what's happening. So let me give you some examples. Um, if this is one of the houses in the United States, um, about 34 million of those homes have a smart power meter, so they can monitor the energy consumption of the entire house. And that data automatically gets sent up to the utility company. And about 10 million homes uh, in the United States have a smart water meter, monitoring overall water consumption. Now, these don't measure the consumption of individual appliances. They're only for the whole, for the whole house. Um, but even just with this information, you can figure out, for example, what time people go to sleep, when all the lights turn off and all the appliances turn off, what time they wake up, when they go on vacation. <clears throat> and if you want to get more fine-grained information than that, then you can add more sensors. So we can disaggregate that power consumption, for example, into individual appliances or water consumption into individual water fixtures. Um, the way people typically do this is to add additional probes, let me say, let me call them probes, to the objects themselves to figure out let's say, when the object turns on or is activated or deactivated, and then how much energy or water it consumes. Um, another way to do that is to add more sophisticated sensing to the power mains or water mains that can help differentiate those objects and identify how much energy or water they're consuming um, in real time. And once you've done that, you can figure out what objects people are using, and from that you can figure out activities. For example, um, if you know that the bathroom sink and the toilet are being used, somebody's probably using the bathroom. If you know that the kitchen sink and the oven are being used, somebody's probably cooking dinner. And that solution works well. The only or one main problem with that is that you're monitoring activities at the household level. So we don't know which individual is cooking. We don't know which individual is consuming water in the bathroom, and so on. And this is a problem in particular for things like elderly monitoring in a house, where you might have one sick individual and one healthy individual, both living in the same house. And you want to know, is the sick individual waking up? When are they sleeping? When are they eating? How often are they using the bathroom? And so on. And if we can't differentiate the different people in the house, um, then we can't do that kind of monitoring. <clears throat> so of course, one problem here is that people don't all live alone. In fact, only 10% uh, of the population in the United States lives alone. So we really do need more effective solutions to monitor individual people in multi-person homes. And the way people would do that today is to add tracking systems. For example, cameras or microphones or um, wearable RFID tags or other solutions like that. Um, <clears throat> as you can imagine, people are reticent sometimes to accept this technology into their homes. And, uh, <clears throat> and so for that reason, it's hard still to monitor multi-person multi homes. And what I'm going to try and convince you of today is that we actually don't need any of that. That all we need to do is instrument the doorways, sense the doorways, and turn those doorways into portals 
to see the multi-person homes, to extract information about the multi-person homes, um, <clears throat> such as uh, activities and energy usage of the individual people. And we can do that um, with no need for cameras or microphones or wearable tags, and no need for additional probes on the objects in the house or the infrastructure in the house. So that's the goal. That's, so why do we believe that the doorway is so important, that the doorway can provide so much information? Why not sense the walls or the windows or the floors or the furniture or the appliances? Well, the reason is that the doors are essential to the rooms, and the rooms are core to the structure of the home. So rooms don't just divide space. Rooms also divide activities. A house, a room, is equipped with furniture and objects for certain activities. You can't sleep in the bathroom. You can't brush your teeth in the bedroom. You can't cook in the living room. Right? Every room is instrumented for specific activities. Rooms also divide things like lighting and heating control. Right? The walls around the rooms help to insulate um, from thermal transfer or light transfer. And so you can control rooms individually, but you can't control necessarily parts of a room or multiple rooms um, as easily. <clears throat> they also divide social interaction. Walls divide people, but common rooms and hallways and so on help bring people together. <clears throat> in fact, the aspect of a doorway and rooms to separating things in a house uh, is so fundamental that just about two years ago from Notre Dame, um, Notre Dame people um, some psychologists performed a study showing that walking through doorways causes forgetting. Um, <clears throat> and the idea here is that you, as you walk through a doorway, your mind believes you're about to change from one episode of activities to another. And for that reason, it files things away in your memory, and it wipes your cache. So it clears, it clears out your working memory. And it does that as soon as you walk through that doorway. And that's how fundamental the doorway is to the structure of the house and the way we perceive the house. And that's why when you walk into a room, often you might find yourself, maybe not you, but I at least, find myself forgetting what I came in the room to do. Because as you walk through that doorway, your, your working set has been cleared. So the, the doorway is not just part of the physical structure of the house. It's a, a core part of the semantic structure of the house. And by sensing that door, we hope to keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening inside that home. So to test this theory out, we built a, a prototype. So let me explain how this prototype works. Um, the prototype is a doorway sensor. And you can see it's kind of a plastic enclosure that snaps in behind a door jam at the top of the doorway. And it's got a lot of sensors built into it. For example, it's got a motion sensor, two motion sensors, in fact, one pointing in each direction to monitor the, the adjacent rooms. Um, some of them have a door latch sensor if the doorway has a door to monitor whether the door is open or closed. Inside that enclosure, you have things like temperature sensor, magnetometer light sensor. And the last thing that you see here is an ultrasonic range finder that can measure distance. And it's pointing downwards into the doorway. And I'll explain to you what all these sensors do and how they work together. Um, but first, let me explain what they're supposed to do. Um, so we take these sensors and we combine them, these doorway sensors, put one in every door in the house. And we combine them with the electric meter and water meter that I discussed earlier that are already being deployed across the country for, because they basically make uh, billing easier for the utility companies. So by leveraging that data and combining that with the doorway data, um, what we hope to produce is something like what this video is about to show you. So you don't need to configure anything. What you do is um, just install these sensors in the doorway, and all of a sudden a map pops up showing the floor plan of your house. So it's been figured out. The person walks into a room, <clears throat> and a black icon follows him in, detects that he turned on the lights and the television, Another person walks through, and a purple icon follows him through. And so the important thing here is that the system was able to figure out that the first person is still sitting in the first room. The second person has moved on to the back room. And it's monitoring the water, light, and electrical activities that person is doing. So the other person walked around uh, out of sight of the camera, but we can still see the person in the bathroom here walking through the other rooms, turns on the light, turns on, flushes the toilet, washes his hands, turns the light off, comes back in, turns off the television, and walks out the door. The other person turns off the microwave and walks out. All this activity is being detected and, uh, by those doorway sensors and the two whole house monitors that I mentioned. Um, we already got some questions. Go for it. Oh, I like that. Um, <clears throat> so I guess the question is, <clears throat> I'm sorry. In this example, like every person is in a different room at every given time. That's why you can actually track them. What if all three people are in the living room and then one decides to leave? 
how do you keep track of who is who? That's a good question. If people, if you have multiple people in the in the room, that can be problematic. And we're still working on solving that problem, but we still think that we can do a pretty good job just sensing at the doorways. And I'll explain why later. Yeah. How are you able to get the smart meter data? Were you getting it from the utility company or directly from the meter itself? Practically speaking, we we installed our own that we could get the data from. Okay, because I was going to say it's really hard to get the data from the utility company. You, yes, you, you can, depending on which part of the country you live in, get that data, although you won't get it at a high enough resolution to do what we're doing. Um, so we basically installed our own. The idea is, in the end, um, that power meter data would be, able to, would be, would be available. And in um, a good number of parts of the country, uh, there are incentives for power companies to give that data to the customers, and they do give that data, although not necessarily at a very high resolution. Other questions? OK. So, so that's basically what it's supposed to do. <clears throat> now let me explain how it works. So I'm going to talk about, in the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll um, tell you about two main things about this application. Um, one is the technology itself, how this whole thing works. And then I'll talk a little bit about applications, which basically means what we're going to do with this kind of technology. Um, so to start out with the technology, um, I'll talk about it in three different pieces. There's first what we call smart blueprints, the thing that infers the floor plan of the house and the location of all the objects in the house. Then there's um, what we call a door jam tracking system that figures out which room people are in. And then there's something we call fixture sense that identifies which fixtures are being used. So the first thing we want to do is figure out, after the person installs these sensors in the doorways, um, how that, what that floor plan looks like and where the sensors are relative to each other. And so if you imagine that um, these circles represent the motion sensors on both sides of that door, we've got one of these doorway sensors in each doorway. And the system, of course, hasn't been configured. It requires no configuration. So to the system, it looks like an anonymous set of unordered doorway sensors. And what it's trying to do is figure out what that floor plan looks like. So the first thing it does is look for motion sensors that detect correlated activity. So if it senses that motion sensors are correlated, it connects them with a line. And it looks for cliques. In this, in the, and it forms a graph, and it looks for the cliques in the graph. And each clique represents a different room. And we know that two motion sensors are put on every side of every doorway, and they're connected in the same physical enclosure. They can't be separated. So for example, these two motion sensors here, we know are connected in the same physical enclosure. Therefore, these two rooms, the blue room and the red room, the blue clique and the red clique, must be connected. So we look for, look for um, adjacent, doorways, uh, adjacent motion sensors and define those to be um, connections between rooms. And from this graph here, we generate what we call a room adjacency matrix. So every clique becomes a room, and every pair of connected sensors becomes a connection between those rooms, an adjacency connection. Question? That's right. Um, the basic idea, the, the high-level intuition is that these motion sensors will all detect the person in the room at the same time. So if you're in a room, then motion sensors in that room will detect you. Um, it's actually much more complicated than that. But for short you know, brevity, I'll, I'll skip over that detail. <clears throat> so you have to, after you install this, you have to walk around the house? Uh, yes, that's right. There's a, that's right. There's a learning period where it figures out the floor plan, and then you can turn on your tablet computer and see the floor plan. So, but it first has to learn that. And we're working on shortening, shortening that. The period of learning period is about one week now. We think we can get it down to a day or less than a day. <coughs> Question. Uh, like, you have like random like uh, S approximation like guesses. Like, since that one's really far away, that might probably influence the house. Or like, if you know that the outlier. <coughs> Uh, the question was, um, can you guess that this might be an entrance to the house because it's far away? Actually, I drew it this way only because that's the actual locations. Mm -hmm. But the system it doesn't know how far away they are. Okay. All it knows is we have an unordered set. Some of them are connected. And some of them, some of them are connected by um, co, um, correlated activity. And some of them are con connected by physical co-location in the same enclosure. And your monitors have, like, are they aware of the other ones, or are they only aware of the second? Um, I think the question is, do the doorway sensors uh, know that other doorway sensors there exist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they have to be sort of on the same wireless channel, let's say, okay. so they can discover each other. That's right. <clears throat> okay, so we end up with this adjacency matrix from that graph. Or, sorry, that we come up with a, a room adjacency matrix, or graph. 
And one thing you notice about this is that it's not very rigid. It's under, con under constrained. So you can pick up one edge of this thing and shake it, and it'll move around a lot. It's kind of floppy. Um, so what we want to do is const add constraints here. And that's what we use the magnetometers in, this, in a doorway sensor for, to monitor the direction of the doorway, the cardinal direction that door of the orientation of that doorway where the, doorway where the door sensor was placed. So for example, some of those sensors might be facing the northerly direction. Some might be facing south. Um, some might be facing east, and so on for each of the doorways. And we use that constraint to define a relationship between every pair of adjacent rooms, which one's east, which one's west, which one's north, which one's south. <clears throat> and we, so this is a much more constrained graph, but it's still not um, fully constrained. For example, this room here might have an interior wall with that room, or might be with this room, or with the combination of these two rooms, and so on. So we don't know exactly how these rooms connect to each other in terms of interior walls, where they don't have doorways. And so the last thing we do is use the light sensors on both sides of that, sense, of that doorway sensor and to figure out which uh, walls in each room are exterior walls. In other words, which, which walls probably have windows. And so the, the light sensor will detect, for example, if it's an east-facing doorway, if it's, a, if it's a doorway into a room on the east side with an east-facing window, it'll detect a lot of light from the east-facing window in the morning. If it has a south-facing window, it'll detect a lot of light midday. And if, it's a west, if it has a west-facing window, it'll detect a lot of light in the evening. And so based on... How, how do you know it's in the morning? You know time. Yes, I know time. time. So yeah, you have a network, so you can do, you can do time. Yeah. <clears throat> so so you, know the, so you know the time of day, and you can estimate based on the, the light patterns, the, the light signature that you get in that room, which, wind, which uh, direction the windows in that room are facing. And so on this graph, we can overlay um, estimated window locations. And now, this is a, more or less a fully constrained graph. And we can piece together the house kind of like a puzzle, where we know, for example, that this is a, a southeast facing window, south, south face, southeast facing room, so it's probably adjacent with this one here. And so we end up with a, with a house floor plan that looks kind of like this. Um, our original floor plan looked like that. They're not exactly the same, but they're very similar. And one of the main differences is that the room sizes in this graph are almost all the same, whereas in here, this graph, they're all very different. Um, we think we can estimate those room sizes as well using things like um, using time, how long it takes, for example, to get from one doorway on one side of the room to the doorway on the other side of the room. Haven't gotten there yet, but that's one possibility to make this look more like that. <clears throat> so one of the challenges here is that, like I said, this is more or less a fully constrained network, but um, not completely constrained. And sometimes there are more than one floor plan that satisfy all the constraints we were able to extract out of these sensors. And you might have more than one floor plan that's viable. <clears throat> and so to address that problem, we basically, when the person opens up their tablet computer and looks at their floor plan for the first time, um, they need to swipe through a few floor plans and choose the one that actually looks like their house. And this is based on the assumption that it's easier to recognize your own floor plan than to create it in the first place, especially for a non-technical user. <clears throat> And so we deployed this system in four different houses. Um, and in three of, this, three of the houses, we had a pretty small number of candidates. So the person had to either swipe, either had only a single candidate, or they had to choose between two different candidate floor plans. Um, in the last house, it didn't work at all. And so we know that there's a lot of work left to be done here. Um, but um, so, so yeah, we know there's a lot of work left to be done, basically. And I won't go into more detail. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, one of the problems with this house was that it had multiple floors. And so we have to add pieces to the algorithm to deal with the multiple floors. Another problem with the house is that it was, um, it was built by an architect who lived in the house. And it had a very modern open floor plan. And so you don't have as much separation between rooms as you would in a, in a conventional home where you have more walls. And that led to problems with motion sensors seeing through rooms, basically. Um, we're trying to address that. We think we can address that with... Um, the height sensors, the, the doorway sensors, sorry, the uh, ultrasonic range finders that I mentioned a little bit early on. Um, I won't go into details about how we're going to do that, but certainly there's work to be done, and, and we have some direction about how to do that. So that's basically how the floor plan system, floor plan inference system works, and, um, and what the results look like so far. Um, next, I'll talk about our door jam tracking system. This is a system that actually figures out where people are in the house. And so the idea is, um, basically that we've got ultrasonic range finders pointing down in the doorway. And typically it monitors the floor, the distance to the floor, 
And when a person walks through, um, it measures the distance to the top of the person's head, thereby inferring the height of that person. And that's how it differentiates the identities of the people in the house. So it knows, for example, the shorter person is in the front room, and the taller person has walked through the front room and then into the back room. Now, just because we know the person's identity as they walk through the doorway doesn't mean we know which room they're in. They could have walked in either direction. So we take that ultrasonic rangefinder and tilt it just a little bit. And that causes an asymmetric sensing region. So when the person walks through the door, we now have an asymmetric response. If the person walks in the direction of the tilt, um, we'll see this, the, the, the shortest distance to the head first and the longer distance kind of trail off. If they walk the opposite direction, this waveform will be flipped. So now we know the person, who the person was, and we know which uh, room the person has entered. And that gives us, that gives us tracking of people inside the house. Yeah. What if they're the same height? And what if you walk wearing your high heels? Yeah, so there's a lot of noise. That's good questions. Um, people typically are not the same height, especially when they live in the same house. So we, we did an analysis of some, uh, I think it was 12,000 homes, and only in 2% of the homes did people ha ha did it, were the residents so close in height that this wouldn't work. I mean, that's because there's age bias and gender bias and other factors that cause people in the same house to be different heights. Um, sometimes you have twins. We just don't support twins. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what happens when you have noise, like high heels and hats? Well, then that causes noise. And people don't always walk straight anyway. So there's a lot of noise in the fact that when you're walking full stride, you're shorter than you are when, you, when you're standing straight up. And that causes noise. Um, and, and one thing that I'm not going to go into detail here about is the fact that we, what, we tr what we end up trying to do is use multiple re consecutive readings and multiple doorways to figure out who the person is. So, um, think of it this way, if, if I know somebody's in the kitchen and some, person A is in the kitchen, person B is in the living room, and we see um, what looks like person B walking out of the kitchen, it's probably an error, it's probably person A. So you can, you can use um, state and history to try and, and sol resolve ambiguities. Yeah, other question? <clears throat> Have we done anything to look at pets? So um, pets are basically not detected by the system because they're too small. Um, if we did have, uh, so, but there is, there are applications for tracking pets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, if we just change the sensors, we could do that. Um, but right now, our sensors don't detect anything lower than a certain height, um, which is good for certain purposes. Yeah, so we, we also cannot detect children right now, which is, which is a good thing for IRB purposes. Um, but, <laughs> but in the future, this would be able to support children, in theory. Um, that's right. Our, the range of the sensors is only about about that far. Question? Yeah, so the range of the sensor is not very far. Um, at least it becomes very inaccurate as you get down towards the ground. <clears throat> um, so we tested this system um, and compared to a conventional tracking system. So you might say, why, why use doorways to track people? Why don't you just use like an RF beacon? People have been doing indoor tracking for a long time. And the reason is because, like I said, rooms are really essential to what, what we're trying to to learn about. And indoor tracking systems using, for example, RF beacons um, don't do room level tracking. They do meter level tracking. And in a, in, a, in a house in particular, you might have a desk sitting very close to a wall. And if you have one meter of error, that puts you on the other side of that wall. Or, or, or people might often sit near a doorway. And we don't quite know which room the person's in. So we compared this, where we, we installed our doorway sensors on the doorways. We saw tracking beacons on where you see all these blue um, beacons. These are basically RF transmitters that look kind of like this, transmit a wireless signal, and we use that to localize the person who is, number one, walking around underneath the doorways, but number two, carrying a, a, a wireless transmitter as well. <clears throat> and the results of this study with um, three sets of two different people showed that our doorway tracking system was able to achieve about 90% accuracy in terms of room uh, localization. Whereas the wearable tracking system got about 37%. And that's not to say that wireless RF wearable tracking doesn't work. But it doesn't work as well for room level accuracy. So if you're talking about meter level accuracy, the, the results would actually be inverted. Right? We'd have smaller, um, smaller error in terms of meter level accuracy for, for an RF tracking system, but higher, higher error for a room level tracking system. Question? Ground truth, How did you get ground, ground truth was. People walking in the study had a little cell phone and tapped on the room that they walked into. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> right, so this is not an in situ study. This was a, you know, one hour each study. Yes. Right. 
in situ so far there are it's hard to get ground truth. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so that's how the door jam tracking system works. And now I'll talk last about the um, the fixture tracking, fixture sensing system. So the basic idea here is that we have now figured out what the floor plan is, and we also know how people move around in those rooms. Um, but we don't know what fixtures are in the house or where they're located. What we do have, though, are um, data streams from the electrical mains and the power mains. And so what we can try to do is, for example, if the person walks through, let's say, doorway number seven, and we detect a flow that looks kind of like a toilet, we can assume there probably is a toilet in that room. And if we then detect flow that kind of looks like a sink, we can assume there might be a sink in that room. A person leaves that room, let's say, walks into a different room, and we start to see um, power data that looks kind of like a light bulb um, or a, uh, and a TV. So we assume there's maybe a 100-watt light bulb in this room and a television. And so from that, we also can uh, figure out all of the other electrical and water fixtures in the house and where they are located in that house. And once we know where those fixtures are located, um, what fixtures there are and where they're located, we can also try to identify what kinds of rooms they are. So for example, any room with a, bath with a toilet is probably a bathroom. Any room with a fridge or a microwave is probably a kitchen. And rooms where people sleep at night, those are bedrooms. Um, that's a good question. The power, the power data, it depends on what, op, what, what you're actually looking at. So if you're looking at a toaster, um, you, know, you might need something like, um, something like on the order of subhertz, so on the order of a few seconds. But if you're looking at um, other things like light bulbs, we found, um, we found that people turn on and off multiple lights within one second period, often, um, which we didn't expect. So you need something lower than one second. Um, what I know I simplified a lot here. We can't just look at the power power data and figure out at that instant when the light bulb turns on. Um, we actually look over a period of time. Again, there's a training period where we try to correlate. Often, when the person's in this room, we see plus or minus uh, a few watts, a hundred watt event, turning on and then turning off. Um, so there's a lot more math going on under the hood here. I'm not I'm not describing. Um, we need to do a lot of noise filtering, and we also need to do some pairing. So we eliminate a lot of false positive events by, let's say, assuming lights always turn off after they turn on. They never turn on twice in a row. Uh, things like that. I'm not going to go into details about. Um, but it's a good question. I'm not to answer your question directly, I'm not quite sure what the minimum resolution is we could get. Um, right now, we're using something like second level resolution. So one hertz. Yeah? So are you able to like, map the path people are taking in the room, or just the point from door sensor to door sensor? So like, if they were like, swerving So the question is, can we detect where people are in the room? The answer is no. We can only know which room the person's in. Okay. <clears throat> so once you figure out uh, which fixtures you think are in the house and where they're located, um, then you want to try to recognize those again later on. And the way we do that is to identify multi what we call a multimodal signature for each fixture. So for example, this sink here uh, might be defined by a motion sensor going off in that, in that bathroom, a certain water flow that we detect on average, maybe the presence of a person, and maybe even the, the usage of neighboring fixtures. Um, and so based on this multimodal pattern, multimodal signature, we can recognize when that specific sink turns on. Otherwise, all the sinks in the, in the house and all the light bulbs in the house look more or less the same, and you can't tell which one turned on or off. Question? So is it within your scope of work to then do kind of like a, a guessing of what people are doing in terms of, oh, one person's home, but now there's 15 people here, so they must be having a party because the oven's on and the fridge keeps on getting opened. Um, or now we know that typically people aren't home at this time, so it must be a robber who's looking in the fridge or someone who's cheating on their spouse looking on their, in the fridge because suddenly there's someone else in the bedroom. <coughs> I'm just, just, because I know that since you're collecting the appliance level data, I'm just wondering if you've started doing that mapping of what can be assumed other than because, I mean, you're starting to do some of it, like, oh, the water, they must have flushed the toilet. Yeah, these are good questions coming from a privacy expert. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I think it is within scope. We haven't gotten there yet. Sure. But we'd like to look into these things and see how much there is we can do. So, so security is actually right now um, the highest gross, the, the biggest industry in terms of billions of dollars um, in terms of home sensing. I think it's somewhere on the order of $20 billion um, market in the U.S. That's, so... Can we transplant that industry? I don't think so, because if a rubber can just get down to the right height and walk through the house and not be detected, 
then it's not a very secure system. Um, so maybe there's, maybe there's something to that. But um, we would like to identify activities that people in the house are doing legitimately. Um, and, and from there, start to identify patterns and so on. Yeah. Question? Are you, sorry, repeat the question. So when l multiple people are in multiple rooms using a lot of different appliances, are you still able to approximate like what are being used? Because you only track the power of the whole house, not each individual room, right? Yeah, that's right. So this is a pr you're, that's a very good question. This is a problem called disaggregation. So you have the aggregate energy and aggregate water for the whole house. And you want to try to figure out how much energy or water is actually being used by this specific picture that we think we identified in, in the learning process. Um, and so that segues directly into my next slide, which shows the results. So we, we focused here on lights and uh, water fixtures, because lights and water fixtures are often ambiguous. I mean, if you have a fridge or a, an oven, those often can be distinctive even at the whole house level. Um, but lights and water fixtures are, are, are very ambiguous because you might have multiple fixtures that are all more or less identical. We use this multimodal signature to try and differentiate those. And we have in black here our ground truth in terms of, let's say, the energy usage for the lights and ground truth in terms of water usage for each fixture. And you can see that the system over time, this is actually an in-situ in study that, in this case, um, over time where you have people in multiple rooms using multiple fixtures, we're still able to get, on average, the more or less the, the right um, amount of energy or water being used by those fixtures even when you have things like multiple fixtures being used simultaneously in different parts of the house. And it's not to say that we recognize the fixture every single time it's used. In fact, we don't. Um, sometimes when it's used, we make a mistake. But often those mistakes cancel each other out. And so on average, you get the right numbers. <coughs> so that pretty much explains how the system identifies the floor plan and tracks people and identifies what fixtures and water fixtures and electrical fixtures are, are being used. Um, another way to look at it might be, let me make an analogy to help explain this in a different way. Imagine that you had a camera at every intersection in the city that could recognize the license plate of cars that move through those intersections. If you did that and you knew which time every car went through the intersection, you'd have a pretty good idea of who was going to the movies, who was going shopping, who was going home. And so we're doing a similar thing here with doorways. We're taking it one step further where you don't start out with a map of the city. All you have is data streams which show the traffic which show the license plate numbers. And from the license plate numbers, you want to infer the map itself and where the movie theater is and where the shopping center is and where the homes are. Yeah? Uh, I need to say a lot. I have a slightly philosophical question. Okay. The fully automated design point. Yeah, which is, I think, <coughs> spectacular, or mostly automated with the you know, floor plan system. I think, I think it's the, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I, I can, I'll try to repeat that. Um, the question is, why go fully automated when some people might be able to add information to help infer some of the stuff that we're learning? Um, and I, the way I think of it is, we, um, we want to infer as much as we can and provide that to people. And if we can do a great job, fine. And if we get it wrong, at least they have a starting point. And so in our user interface, in our, in our last user interface, um, at least we've started to try to get um, an interface where you can, let's say, tap on an, on an appliance and move it. And so you can correct things. And from the corrections, the system can also learn other things like, oh, well, if that room doesn't actually have an oven, then maybe that's something else. Maybe that's a, a space heater, things like that. <clears throat> so so we, I think we can still go the route of trying to automatically learn everything and then let people um, try to add corrections if they want to. But it's a good to have a starting point. Agreed. Yeah. A week versus 30 minutes is a big difference. Um, we're targeting 30 minutes. Yeah. Right now we're at a week. And um, we see a path to get there that I won't go into. <clears throat> OK, so other questions. So I'm about to transition from how it all works to what we can do with it um, in whatever time we have left. 
Are there questions now? Yeah. This might be. Uh, this is more related to the door jam. But what happens if there? So you said then if like A's in the kitchen, but you could have detected that like B's walking out of the kitchen, but B's not in the kitchen. Then you assume that A's walking out of the kitchen. But then if you had like certain states and your actions didn't really make sense, and then you infer from that, and then if those things, li if those little errors build up, do you refresh? and like reset the whole um, door things, or do you just keep adding to the finite states? Um, this is, a, I, think, I think what you're asking is, um, as you're estimating state in real time, what happens when you realize you made a mistake in the past? Does it crash, or does it refresh? So that's a good question. We, we, there is a commit point where we can no longer go back, and that's, we, we can define that in terms of the fact that we'll no, never get more information about the past, so we do have a commit point. But up until then, we, give the, we can give the user, let's say, one of two outputs. One is the current estimate, estimate of what's happening, and one is the, um, the best estimate of what's happening. So we can either show them um, you know, what's happening, what we think it is now, or, or we, can, we can show them what you know, later on, they can go back and, look and replay, and they'll see some different estimate, let's say. Um, but there are, there are constantly, we're actually working with um, what's called a particle filter. So there are thousands of estimates of what's going on, and we have to try to distill that down in real time. And at some point, it commits, but it's not in real time. It might be um, delayed by minutes or hours even. Yeah, question. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you um, just mean to keep things proportional to scope? Like when I told you that there's eight possible states, like how then could you be pretty sure as to what the answer is if you're not observing things the right way? Like I, I think the question is what happens if you're interested in only one person instead of everybody in the house? Oh, that's a good question. What, are, what happens if we're not allowed to track anybody else? I don't know. I don't think we, would, I don't think we can do that right now. I don't think there's any way to do that. We, there's, there's, there's always, <laughs> unless they're really short, we can't do that. Um, <laughs> they have, yeah, exactly, they have to crawl. <laughs> um, we, there's always some uncertainty about who the person is and who's using an appliance and which appliance is being used. and so. Because of that uncertainty, I'm not sure that we're, we're sort of constantly resolving that uncertainty as time goes on and resolving it into the past. And so uh, um, I'm not sure there's any way for us not to sense people if they're in that house. Yeah. I'm not sure that you already addressed this or not, but um, what happens in the very rare case of two people are going through the door with the same time? A little rare, but how does the system work? Um, good question. If two people go through the door at the same time, um, and let's say they actually squeeze through the door simultaneously, then we can't get them. Um, Usually, uh, there's a space between them, and that space is detectable. So let's say the space is even as small as a foot. Now, that would be very uncomfortable to walk behind someone um, with a foot space, but you can still pick that up and know that there was a, there was a, a, space, a gap there, and we can separate that into two events. So it's like one person's coming through the opposite direction, the other person's going through. <clears throat> yeah. In, in that case, um, we might miss one of them. We'll miss actually the shorter one, because we'll detect the taller one, and that'll be called a false negative. So we missed somebody. And Hopefully, because you saw the person over here and you saw them on the other side, then you can infer they must have walked through at some point. We don't really know when, but we know they walked through. So it's a false negative. OK, so um, what I'd like to do now is transition a little bit from how this whole thing works to some of the applications that um, we've been using it for. There are a number of applications here, um, ranging from heating control to hot water heating um, to, to um, lighting control. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to focus on only um, two of those, the middle ones, just because we're a, sh a little short on time. But I'll, um, please do stop me if you have any questions about those. So the, the applications that we've been focusing on are, um, are energy, energy conservation, primarily in the energy conservation realm. And the reason is because um, residential energy is a big problem. It, count, it accounts right now for 22% of the total U.S. energy usage in the, uh, total energy usage in the, in the country, in the U.S. Um, so it's a pretty large fraction, um, larger than cars, for example. Uh, all of transportation, including um, cars, planes, trains, buses, boats, um, that's 28%. So 22% is a large fraction. The way people save energy in homes today is to do what we call a physical retrofit. You might have an energy audit where they use thermographic cameras or blower doors to identify how energy is being lost from that house. And then do things like um, in add insulation 
or change your windows or upgrade your HVAC system or upgrade your water heater. Um, and these solutions work really well. They can bring your energy bill down from hundreds of dollars a month down to tens of dollars a month. But the only reason why people don't do them more often is because they're very expensive. Um, so typically ranging somewhere between $5,000 and $25,000 a house. Now the average energy bill in the U.S. is only $80 a month. So if you save 30% of that, 25% um, of that is $20 a month. It takes a long time to pay back your $25,000 investment. So that's the only reason why people don't do this more often. Um, this is a big problem, and we're working on the hypothesis that um, what we call a computational retrofit, so adding sensors, intelligence, and control, um, can save as much energy in homes as physical retrofits, but at 10 to 100 times lower cost. And specifically, we're targeting something like um, $300 for the base sensing system plus the cost of actuation. Yes? Uh, the thermal cam thermographic camera, you, getting that, um, sometimes you can get it for free if there's a company that's sort of sponsoring it somehow. But um, it typically costs on the order of a couple hundred dollars to get an energy audit, which might include a thermographic picture. But what I'm talking about here is the actual retrofit itself. Um, so adding insulation to a small house on average costs somewhere between four to $6,000. Um, larger houses are even more. And when you start upgrading the HVAC system or we're upgrading windows, um, you quickly can get to $25,000. And many people, keep, many, many people um, go well over that. If they add solar panels, for example, that, that takes up your whole budget right there. <clears throat> so, so our goal is to, to show that sensing intelligence, intelligence and control can save a lot of the energy that would be saved otherwise by physical retrofits, uh, but at a much lower cost. And so the first thing we started out with um, was to look at heating and cooling because it's the biggest energy consumer in typical homes, 43% on average in the U.S., much higher, closer to 60% in the colder climates, um, like Canada and the UK. Um, so we came up with two solutions to, to address this. Um, the first is called a smart thermostat that basically tries to identify with occupancy sensors when, you, um, when you're not home and turn the temperature down. And I won't go into details. The challenge here, of course, is to turn the temperature up at the right time so you don't cause miscomfort, uh, discomfort. That's what we call preheating. And in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this analysis here about when we decide how to preheat, even though we don't know when a person's going to come home. Um, overall, the solution compared to optimal, optimal was about 35%. So that means if you knew exactly when people were going to come and go. Um, if you use our system, it's about 28% energy savings of your HVAC energy. Um, and a simple system that just turns on and off the way your lights turn on and off when you occupy a room, that actually only saves 6.8% on average. And in four of the houses, actually increased energy usage. See, so these solutions you can buy today on the market, um, I'd caution you. Um, to, be, to be sure that you're not one of these four that's actually increasing energy usage if you use those. Um, and I can go into more detail offline if you want to know how, how uh, a reactive system might increase your energy usage. Um, taking that 28.8% and multiplying it by the 43% that we have for heating and cooling on average um, translates to an energy savings of about 12% on average for homes. Um, at least for those homes that look like the ones we tested, the eight homes we tested. Um, the next system um, uses more of the... Um, more of the uh, occupancy sensing system that I was talking about earlier. The basic idea here is um, that based on our preliminary analysis, when we looked at houses, it turned out that even when people were in the house, they were only using half the house or less. And this makes sense because, like I said, rooms are designed for activity. So you sleep in your bedrooms at night. You use your kitchen and your living room during the day. Um, so typically in the house, only half the house is used at any given time. And so we can save some energy by not heating and cooling those parts of the house that are empty for large periods of time. So when a person walks into the house during the day, we heat and cool the living spaces. And when they go to sleep at night, we start heating and cooling the, the bedrooms, and we stop heating and cooling the living spaces. So we built this system and deployed it um, over, over, uh, over several weeks. And we showed that this system can save about 21% 21, 21 energy savings, can produce about 21% energy savings, um, even when people are, are home almost all the time. Now, this was a fairly short study. Um, it's statistically significant with alpha equals 0.15. Um, so we're still doing additional studies to make sure that um, we get, we get uh, more numbers for that. But if we were to take these numbers as, um, as an approximation for now, and we multiply it by the 43% for heating and cooling overall, that translates to about an additional 7% um, heating and cooling uh, savings when people are home. So this, is, this system saves energy when people are away. 
This one saves energy when people are, are home. Now, after that, after heating and cooling, we looked at the next biggest energy consumer in the house, which is um, the water heater. The water heater in an average house in the U.S. consumes about 14% of the energy bill. And typically, um, when people talk about heating a uh, water heater energy, they think of insulating a tank. You, you waste a lot of energy in a tank. Um, turns out that tank loss is only about 10% of your total heating bill. And so we're looking at additional um, sources of loss. <clears throat> in particular, when the, when the heating system, when the, when the sink turns on, hot water flows through the pipes. And when you turn it off, the hot water sits there and cools down. And that causes what we call pipe loss, which actually accounts for 20% of your heating bill. So heat being lost through those pipes. And in um, some preliminary studies, we found that, in fact, there's another reason why people lose energy in their, in their hot water tanks. This is the fact that you turn on the hot water, and then you turn it off before the hot water even gets to the tap. And so the hot water sits in the pipe and, and gets lost again. This counts for another 4%. This is what we call a short event. This counts for another 4% of loss. And when we questioned our, our participants, we found that the reason they were turning on the hot water tap and not actually using hot water is that they might have had something in their right hand, like a toothbrush or a bar of soap. They turn on the faucet with their left hand, and that's where the hot water is. Um, so they don't actually need hot water. They don't, they don't want to wait for the hot water, but they turn it on anyway, draw hot water out of the tank, and cold water goes in, which then needs to be heated. So a complete waste of energy. <clears throat> so the solution that we're trying to that we're exploring now um, is <clears throat> to add flow meters to our, to our um, hot water mains and our cold water mains to identify um, how much water, what the temperature of the water at a fixture currently is. So people typically mix at the fixture. You turn on some hot water, some, hot, some cold water. We sense how much is being used at the fixture and what temperature the person wants. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> So we learn, we, we already know, like I was explaining before, which water fixtures have turned on. And we learn a profile for each fixture, what the temperature is that people want. And it turns out that every fixture has its own um, water temperature, desirable temperature. So showers are typically in the order of 95 to 105 degrees, um, depending on the person. And sinks can be different. So a kitchen sink might be 120 degrees if you're washing dishes, but a bathroom sink might again be about 105 degrees. Um, so if you learn the temperature that people want, then you use a water mixer afterwards, once you've identified the, that a fixture has turned on, to pipe water at the right temperature to that fixture. So if you're typically piping, let's say, 130 or 140 degree water, and it's cooling down to 70 degrees, we're now piping something like 100 degree water cooling down to 70 degrees. So we've, we've reduced that pipe loss by on the order of 50%. And I won't go into details about the, the results, um, but we analyzed this on the order of, um, of, I think it was five different houses. and um, and demonstrated energy savings of about 10% without the person noticing anything at all in terms of hot water usage. So they never noticed the water being colder. And if we were willing to make them um, feel cold water every now and then because we were a little bit aggressive and we got it wrong, they, they actually did hot, want hot water and, and we didn't know it, or they wanted water that was hotter than we expected, um, then we can save additional energy up to about 15%. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over those, those results, and I think I'm going to have to skip over this Last piece also, but I'll give you the basic idea. Um, the problem here that we're trying to solve is, is um, what's called daylighting. So you use um, daylight from the windows to, heat, to, to light the room, and when there's enough daylight, you dim the lights inside. Now, the problem that we had to face is that daylight is an unstable light source. It changes all the time because of clouds and, and other factors like shadows. Um, and so you don't want to be flickering the lights on and off and closing the blinds and opening, opening them. It turns out, in fact, that um, people who are you know, daylight harvesting systems that are out there today 50% um, of them are disabled because people find them annoying. They're, they're changing too much. And the ones that aren't annoying are too conservative. They don't save enough energy. And so they're only 50% as effective as they were expected to be. So the, the savings from daylight harvesting is pretty low right now. And what we're trying to do is um, predict the actual light levels in the future and change the, energy har the, the daylight harvesting system so that it can um, provide the right le lighting levels without causing annoyance to the, to the user. So again, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over these details um, but the basic idea was um, <clears throat> that the end result is that we're able to reduce glare by about 45% and reduce um, energy waste by about 60% simultaneously. And at, at this particular operating point, other operating points give you a different trade-off. <clears throat> so if you take that 60% um, energy waste reduction and you apply it to the 10% uh, of, ener of energy that's typically used for lighting, that's about 4%. 
And now you take the energy savings from heating and cooling, water heating, and lighting, and you combine them all together. Um, and that will, look, that will add up to about 25% of the household energy usage. Now, this is all very experimental, small, small sample sizes, and so on. So we've typically analyzed these houses somewhere between, uh, analyze these systems from, with somewhere between four and 10 houses at a time. Um, so very small sample sizes, not necessarily conclusive. Um, there's a lot more work to be done. But if we were to take the results that we have now, the data that says um, that we're able to save about 25% of household energy usage. Now, now to put that in per into perspective, let's bring it back to the, the overall graph where we talk about 22% um, of the total US energy budget being residential homes. 25% um, of that is about 5.5% energy savings. In comparison, um, the entire aviation industry, meaning all planes, commercial jets, and so on, is about 2.5% of the national energy budget. So even if we're able to save only half the energy savings that our data currently predicts, um, that would still be about the same as making all planes in the world um, solar powered for free, um, or for the cost of adding these systems to the homes. So <clears throat> um, we think it's a promising direction. This is sort of why I think um, computer science is the, the fastest way of, um, the, the best and the easiest way, uh, way to save the world. Um, so I hope you, I convinced you. Um, I want to just thank all the people in my group who've contributed a lot to this um, to this project, and uh, happy to take questions. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, are you able to like? Did you have like a database of like floor temp floor plans and can you kind of guess like the most common floor plans used, or you know, do you? Cause yeah. If you know, like. That's a that's a really good good point that um, a lot of a lot of neighborhoods have similar floor plans. So you can use data from multiple houses probably to come up with an idea of what these floor plans might look like. Um, we haven't tried to do that. So basically, what you're trying to say is use a prior on um, on your floor plan distribution, and we haven't tried to do that. Okay. But that could help a lot. In fact, um, some architects have told me you know there are only a limited number of floor plans. Right. Uh, so. And unless you have enormous houses, they'll typically be a, be a finite set. So we could we could do something like that. So are are you like developing like I guess pattern recognition like across multiple houses, or just are you just doing this per household? Uh, like trying to learn the patterns per household versus using multiple households. <coughs> to That's a good question. Um, so the, I think the question to repeat the question is. Um, are we trying to identify patterns in a single house, or are we trying to find patterns across houses? And I think ideally we would do the latter. It's very expensive to run these studies, so we haven't been able to scale up more than about 10 houses, 10, 10 houses in a particular study. So we can't do that yet. Okay. Um, but ideally, that's where we'd go. Um, yeah, that's right. So a water mixture can basically take a proportion of hot water and a proportion of cold water. And this is sort of how your, um, there are certain showers that are thermostatically controlled. So you have, um, you set the temperature, and no matter whether somebody flushes the toilet or not, you'll never get burned because it automatically adjusts the hot and the cold temperature. So you could use something like that to choose the temperature, and then it would just mix the water in the right proportions. Um, we didn't build a hot water heater, so this is all analysis based on the homes that we instrumented. So we measured how much hot water was being used, what the temperature of that water was, what the temperature of the water was at the tap, and when people turn, when people actually use the water, um, and then did an analysis of if we had replaced that water heater with a new one that did this, um, how much energy would actually have been saved? So we didn't build hot water heaters and rep, you know um, retrofit all these houses. Um, so if we were to do that, we would end up using something like this thermostatically controlled water valve that I was talking about. Yeah, that's a good. It's a good question. Um, I think that. I think that ultimately, uh, the long-term solution. Maybe it's, and I guess our privacy people have less, so I'd love to get their feedback on this one. Um, ultimately, the solution. Who knows how far into the future will be to use cameras to track people around and to figure out what's happening. 
I don't think uh, the population at large is ready for that yet. And one of the main reasons for doing the work the way we did it is to not collect any private information about people. So we're not using microphones, we're not using cameras, we're not requiring people to, to wear tracking devices. Um, but ultimately, I, th I do think that things like, like Connect um, and other systems like that will be um, invaluable. Right now, I don't think people would be happy having them in their bathrooms, right. for example. Like not necessarily. It could be complementary. I think it could just be a solution in, in itself. Yeah? More generally, is, this, uh, is the processing for this, figuring out what's going on, is that done by a central unit? Is that completely, are, there, are you adding this to an existing computer, or um, do you have to bring this up to the for this? Right now, because it's experimental, all the data is being collected at one PC in the house and then uploaded to a, to a, to a database where we do all the processing. Um, and some of that processing is online. Most of it is offline. We do it post facto. Um, in a real system, I think people wouldn't want their data to be sent out of the house. So you would end up with something like a tablet computer on the wall. Maybe that's a home console. Uh, maybe it's a thermostat. And that's what's doing all the processing. And hopefully the data never has to leave the house. Now, of course, if you want to do correlations with neighbors or um, aggregate information across uh, multiple houses, you'd have to aggregate that data somehow. And there might be some way of getting anonymous data out of that house. Um, like that's exactly what. Activity. Yes. So if you're so that little so that little that, okay. map that you saw in the yeah. beginning, um, if you pull that up on your yeah. phone okay. and you tap into the data stream, uh, then you would be able to see that kind of thing. Um, our our goal is not actually to present that visualization to the users. That's more or less for our purposes. Right. Um, the goal is maybe um, it, use that data to automatically do control of the house, to give aggregate feedback like you should be doing, you should be cooking at different times of day or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but in theory, yes. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you.